Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Ariel Sorrenti, and we're going to be speaking about training your team and setting prices on the Myopia Podcast. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Thanks again for joining us for this episode. Uh, today, we're joined by uh, Dr. Ariel Sorenzi, and uh, it is a pleasure to have you here. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you. I just had a whirlwind of a day in practice and so happy to be here. So thank you for having me. Yeah, it's absolutely our honor. So many of you have uh, have heard of Ariel, and, and she's just been making a, 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 a big splash in uh, the specialty contact lens, dry eye, myopia management uh, area, which obviously is a, a huge interest of mine. And uh, we have, uh, have known each other peripherally, but gotten to know each other more recently, um, particularly around the glue of myopia management. Would you, would you agree? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We um, got to talk a lot more at the uh, MySight event, which was super cool to be there for all of that research that was coming out with, with Paul. Yeah. So, so depending on when you're listening to this, uh, we have, uh, we're have we recording it right after the MySight data has recently come out um, on their six-year data. And uh, just some incredible information about myopia management and what myopia management can do. And specifically, they launched their data around my site. And so Paul Chamberlain, who's going to be on the podcast in a couple of weeks, uh, is uh, sharing his data. And we got to, to go down there. So, Ariel, why don't you tell us what you do in optometry, where you're located, and a little bit about your practice setting? Yeah, so I am in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I am in a private practice. It's a vision source private practice. And we have two locations. Um, we have basically, right now, I would say we have like two and a half full time doctors. Um, so, pretty small practice. And I joined right after residency as the primary full time doc at, at one of our locations. Okay. And in your practice, you do, uh, you do full scope optometry, correct? Yes. Full scope. We see everything from infancy exams, you know, those six month olds all the way up to, I think my oldest patient is like 105 years old. Um, you know, so we do glaucoma, dry eye, and, uh, a really big focus on specialty contact lenses, and myopia management. That was really my goal when I joined the practice was to build up specifically the myopia management and the specialty lens sector pretty significantly, because that's what I wanted to do with the majority of my day. That's what I knew would bring me a lot of fulfillment and really what makes me very happy. So um, you had done a residency before joining the practice. What, what was it about, hey, I want to do myopia management that made that a major focus? focus when you went into practice that that for most of us is something that we develop while we're in practice but it seems like for you you were like you came out of residency and that's like this is what I want to do yeah so you know I think with anybody that's passionate about specialty lenses we just love changing people's lives for the better and that's that's what we see day in and day out with sclerals but for myopia management just to me, the fact that our profession has the ability to change someone's life in such an impactful way where we can help really preserve their vision and help decrease the risk of having these ocular diseases in the future. I just think that's such a cool and unique thing that our profession has. And I, you know, long term, we're providing great benefits, but short term, when you fit a child in orthokeratology, or contact lenses, it's really cool to see how their personalities evolve, how they get more self-confident, different types of sports that they're involved in now. So I really saw myopia management along the same lines and maybe even more so than um, compared to doing like a scleral lens for somebody with keratoconus. So how much myopia management was being done in the practice when you first joined? 
Um, there were, there was very little. Um, there was still some that was being done, but it really wasn't a major focus. Um, the owner of the practice is pretty, very much so involved in Vision Source, and um, I think he would have done a ton more if he would have been able to have more time in clinic. But it just really, it just wasn't a big part of the practice initially. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you've entered into the practice. This is a major focus. I presume that when you said, hey, this is what I want to do in practice, there was an openness and there was a, an acceptance of that. Um, for, for, for your scenario, but uh, for others, is when you want to bring myopia management into the practice and you're not an owner, like what does that conversation look like? Like what are some things that you recommend people really hit on in that discussion? I think it's important to think about how it's going to benefit the practice, you know, not only from a financial standpoint, but also from kind of a general morale of the practice, you know, that myopia management is something where you and the rest of your team can really tell that you're making a big difference. So I really feel like it helps boost the morale of the practice. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's also really important to when, when this is something that you want to do, kind of have it all laid out on how exactly, you know, you're going to, what your ideas are for billing for it, what your ideas are for scheduling, <clears throat> how you're going to train staff, because you want to make sure that when you're bringing on this specialty, it doesn't become a disruptor to the practice, that things aren't chaotic when you bring it on. And that's, those are probably the three most important things when bringing it to the owner that, you know, you're fully prepared and this thing is going to be successful. Yeah. So, so go through those things. Like what, what was the piece of paper? What did it all include that you like brought this formal invitation? And and what, what I'm understanding is that you didn't do is you didn't go and say, Hey, I want to do more myopia management. Can I do that? Uh, you, it sounds like you laid things out and what, what was all included in that kind of go through that piece by piece and some of those topics and, and then how you went about doing them, right? How did you develop mm-hmm. the billing? How did you develop the staff training and what were the things that you hit on? And, and, and that's a really big question. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Um, there, you know, there already were some mechanisms in place when I joined because though we weren't doing a ton of myopia management at the university office, the office that I'm at, we did have our doctor in South Charlotte doing quite a bit of myopia management. But what I really sat down and looked at is does this does this management fee that we're charging make sense? One, if we're going to be seeing an orthokeratology patient back, you know, six to eight times a year, are we losing money or um, are we doing okay? And so sat down and we looked at the chair costs. Um, So the chair cost is what amount of money do we need to make in order to break even And then we kind of extrapolated that for however many exams we were going to do our material costs. And we, we did adjust the, we do a global fee. We did adjust it after we evaluated that. Um, And then we looked at scheduling, you know, with all of this extra testing that we're doing and the fact that we're going to be doing topographies on wiggly little children, um, biometry on wiggly little children that we needed to build in some extra time. So we didn't create chaos for the staff. But I think what was most important was the fact that we had a plan on how to educate our team members on the importance of myopia management. And I will say that I definitely didn't do a very good job in the beginning of that. Um, And that was evident to me when some of our team members would quote like the global fee for myopia management, where I would walk by and I would hear, you know, that that fee being presented. And it was almost like apologetic, like, Oh, this is how much it's going so, to be. So sorry. The doctor's going to charge you this much. Like, yeah, yeah. Like I know it's a lot, but like, uh, it's worth it, you know? So, um, one of the things that we determined was super important to make this successful is that we had our team 100% on board on understanding why we charge what we charge, what really walking them through what chair cost looks like for us in order for you to have this job and be able to get a paycheck. These are some of the things that we need to think about. Um, 
talking about those follow-ups, how much our equipment costs, <laughs> um, all of that to help them understand exactly what they're quoting and why. And also just the impact of myopia management and the importance that these children get in it sooner rather than later. Um, so I know that I rambled on for a little while, but I just like very passionate about it. So I could just talk for days. Yeah, so, <laughs> but, so, um, so let's dig into what you talk to your staff about, like, how do you educate mm -hmm. them and what are the important things that you're bringing up to them? Like, here's the things that you need to know. Here's the things that you need to say to patients. Did you, do you have some specific examples of what, what those are like? Yeah. So I would um, do lunch and learns and I didn't try to cram it all into one. I did, I did them over time. So one of the presentations I was going over specifically kind of like we talked about what chair costs looked like for us and how that global fee was developed. Um, another lunch and learn was why myopia is an issue because, you know, for as long as they've known myopia, that's kind of been the bread and butter of the practice. You just add a few clicks of minus, everybody's happy. Um, you know, why all of a sudden are we doing something about it now? So we talked about that. Then we talked about the different treatment options and how they work and how to explain them to patients kind of in layman's terms. Um, another discussion that we had was how to answer difficult questions and maybe questions that they've received before and just didn't know how to answer them. And that's something that's really important to think about too, because, you know, you have this beautiful consultation in the exam room and you think that you've covered everything. And then you're probably just getting lots of head nods and they're thinking in their yeah. mind, million other things. What, what are some of those difficult questions? Frequently so, asked questions that are some difficult. Frequently, yeah. Um, I would say some frequently asked questions would be one, why have I never heard about this before? Uh -huh. And that might be pretty difficult for your staff to answer, right? Like they've been with you for years and years. And now all of a sudden you're trying to charge this patient X amount of money. And why can't I just go buy new glasses? Um, so that's a big one. And we, we, we talked to our team about, you know, research is always evolving and we're always staying on top of the latest uh, research and offering our patients everything that we know. And um, that changes over time. And now we know that this truly should be the standard of care for our young progressive myopic children. And by just prescribing you glasses, like we've done previously, then we know now with research that that's actually doing you a disservice because as you see, things are getting worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this lunch and learn thing, right? Do you pay for lunch? We do. Mm -hmm. And you pay them to listen to you? We do. That's the only we, way I can get my staff to listen to me too, is have to pay them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we provide them lunch and then um, let them stay clocked in. I like this. So um, do they then have, do you give them like 15 minutes to go and do other stuff? Or is it like, okay, lunch is from 12 to one or one to two. And like, we have patients up until then, and then an hour, and then we're back on the back seeing patients. How's that work in your office? Yeah, that would probably be great if we gave them a little bit of a break instead of, <laughs> but we don't, we're a patient care, all of the information room for questions and then get back at it. But all that's right, a, all right. I should start I like incorporating it. a break. I, they, I like they, it. Thanks, Dave. They, yeah, they might want to go to the bathroom. Um, <laughs> so, okay. There's no great. time for that. Now, now I love this thing about training our training our team, right? And, and, and so often of us in the eye care industry, we go to a conference or we, you know, hear somebody talk and we implement this into our practice, which means that we're going to start talking to patients about it. But really, you need to take a step back and you need to get the people that are on on board with you to uh, to make sure that they're advocating. I mean, if you're the captain of the ship and you're like pointing where we need to go, but you don't have everybody's, you know pumping, pumping the oars the right way and getting them all on, on the same page. It, it really does. I like this. Uh, so, so, so let's talk about these staff training things like frequently asked questions. So maybe write up something for your staff of frequently asked questions. And all of us probably could think about them. Why have I never heard of it? 
Why is it so expensive? How long am I going to need to do this? Like, I think mm-hmm. we could all brainstorm some of those. And, uh, and then why do we need to do myopia management? Teaching our staff about that, right? It reduces the, the refractive burden so you can see better without glasses. It might be the sort of thing where you might be more capable of doing uh, LASIK later in life. It's easier to fit contact lenses on somebody who's a minus three than a minus 10, like all those things. And we've spoken about those on the myopia podcast before, also talking about the reduced risk for, uh, for the eyeball stretching and the diseases that go on. We've kind of talked about those. I want to hit on the other thing that you were talking about is setting your fees, right? So, so many people have a hard time presenting something that is near or more than a thousand dollars in their practice, right? So how do you go about that? You don't need to speak to the specific fees per se. I mean, you're certainly welcome to in this platform, but um, well, how do you set that? So is it that, you know, a, an eye exam might generate you $200, $300 and you're like, okay, if we're going to miss out on three eye exams, then we need to take it times three. Or how do you go about that? This chair cost thing is a nebulous concept to many eye care providers. If you look up chair cost, I feel like there are just a million different formulas to look mm-hmm. at. Um I like looking at the SLR's MBA metrics on kind of what an average practice is supposed to to look like chair cost wise. And then they have, you know, a range of percentage percentages of practices that are on the small scale versus large. And I just kind of worked through those numbers and really do you have I didn't a roundabout do... number of, of what that is just as a guess. Do you have do you remember from the Yeah, SLR I think document? ours I think the average was 114. Mm-hmm. If I if I remember correctly, what the national average was, I'd have to check on that. And 114 is what we need to make to break even per right. half hour. For, per per exam for comprehensive exam. Uh huh. Um, so we looked at that, and we looked at how we structured the follow up. So it's a little bit different for orthokeratology versus like an atropine. So we made our contact lens um, global fee different from what atropine is, and we actually made our contact lens fees the same. And remind me, I want to go. I want to go through kind of how we have our our global fee set up because I really I like the way that we do it, and I feel like it does create some buy in for patients because we do allow them to use their insurance. Um, we call it discounts um, as well as a. Uh, self-pay. So I can go back to that, but essentially we looked at our schedule and we said, okay, if we're going to spend, you know, 20 minutes, doctor time, 10 minutes time for technician, when does it make sense to build those into our schedule? And that may may take a full comprehensive exam or maybe you're pretty efficient and you put it into like a contact lens follow-up slot that wouldn't be revenue generating anyways so i think that's pretty practice specific you know when can you bring pull it into your schedule and what makes sense to you and is that a revenue generating spot that you're taking or is it like a contact lens follow-up that would have been covered under their fitting fee anyways so we started it by um, doing the follow-ups to be in like a, a contact lens follow-up slot that was close to lunch or at the beginning of the day. That way we had more time with that patient. And that's just how it worked out with our schedule. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, w- why is there a different <laughs> fee for atropine versus contact lenses? Is it just that you anticipate you're going to see them less often? I think the um, the complexity of atropine and the the um, evaluation that you're having to do for atropine is less involved than contact lenses, um, and then also we're not billing for atropine itself; they're they're paying the pharmacy for that. Um, and with the contact lens modalities, you know, you're billing for the the materials as well. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, so we actually priced my site in orthokeratology the same. We would tell if patients were 
candidates for both, we would tell them basically the the pros and cons of each one, you know, uh, maybe they're a better candidate for orthokeratology because they're a swimmer or whatever, but we give them both options, the description of the options, and then we let them pick based off of modality as opposed to price. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one thing I've, I've, I've heard people talk about in, in the idea of setting prices the same versus different for different contact lenses is maybe your cost of goods is considerably different. Say my site, you know, maybe six or $700 for a year supply uh, or, or, or more depending on, on, on where you are and what you do. Um, and then your cost to, uh, to do my, a myopia management may be, you know, far less, far more, depending on who you are. Should that go into the cost of, uh, of, of how you do it? Or is it just kind of even out because of the number of visits that you do? Or how's that? How do you consider that? Yeah, that's how we saw it is that, you know, with my site, um, for example, we're probably going to have less follow-ups to consider in that global fee versus orthokeratology. We're probably going to be seeing them more. So yes, the material costs are very different, but also the the follow-ups are going to be less so with my site and more so with orthokeratology. Yeah. Yeah. So in in kind of summary here, I think uh, I think you you you, you th this fee setting is really difficult, and it's a big obstacle for people when they're considering myopia management. I know everybody who's doing myopia management always is kind of questioning how they're doing it and if they should do it a little bit different. My encouragement for those of you that are listening is that um, you know you look at the amount of time that it's going to be taking you to see these patients, the average number of visits that you're going to be seeing them. If you're brand new to myopia management, you may be seeing patients a little bit more frequently. You and, and if you have a lot of myopia management patients in your practice, you're probably seeing each of those patients less often throughout the year. Uh, on average, somebody that's successful with their myopia management, I see them two and then sometimes three times a year, uh, depending on if they're doing well with their treatment. If they're not, it might be four times a year. You know, we're seeing them around their exam or their fitting of whatever it may be. And then there's also an aspect uh, area that I think that we also bring into this is the value, right? So uh, what is the value to a patient compared to a pair of glasses, uh, compared to a, a regular soft contact lens that they may have orthokeratology providing freedom from glasses and contact lenses that probably has a little bit of a premium that we're, we're, we're experts in this field and having to have had extra training for that. So all that kind of comes in and is, is most of us think about where, where this, where this should fit in as far as a revenue in our practices. Um, I think most people come about at the same dollar amount, um, but making sure you can justify that and feel comfortable and that you don't feel like you're losing money in the practice, which I think is the biggest concern everybody kind of has. Anything that's so you would important. add? Yeah. yeah, that's so important. I mean, you really, a couple of things you really want to you don't want to um, regret that you're doing myopia management because you know you're losing money and you were trying to be competitive with someone down the street. Um, it really does need to be based off of your practices, financials, um, and there. You know, Paragon has a, a calculator that's available. They have a couple that can help you basically put in what you charge your usual and customary for a comprehensive exam. Um, you know, there's, there's webinars that are available, like through Wu University, I, I yep. did one where I walked through um, specific examples on calculating your chair cost with examples that might be helpful. Um, you know, mm -hmm. so there's different resources that that can be used, but we certainly don't want it to be like LASIK, where all of these surgeons were kind of at a race to the bottom of who could offer the cheapest price. Yeah. Yeah. I think we, I think we all lose, including the patients and, and their parents on that. Well, I think this has been incredibly helpful, right? On the, on the aspects of making sure that we're, you know, training our team, um, you know, bringing, uh, bringing an, an area for uh, setting our fees is such an important component of this. Um, any closing thoughts here uh, before I let you go? Um, I did want to 
talk a little bit about how we yeah. set up our global fee. Yes, um, please. Because I, I really love um, how we kind of fuse the two. So sure. what we do at our practice is we have like a medical, a myopia, myopia management medical fee, and that is completely self-pay. Uh, we let patients know this is a bigger sum. Um, well, we don't tell them it's a bigger sum. We let them know that this sum is not discountable for your vision insurance because of the medical management side of things for myopia. Um, but we do allow them to use their insurance contribution for their lenses material, and then they just owe what's remaining. And then we do charge a separate like fitting fee as well that they're able to utilize their benefit for. And we just kind of charge the highest tier, you know, different practices have different fitting fees. We charge the highest for myopia management uh-huh. and it gives this illusion of a discount that they're able to have. And that's, mm-hmm. that's been really helpful during the quoting process. Um, so I just wanted to add that as something, you know, you don't have to do just fee for service. You don't have to do just self-pay global fee. You can yeah. maybe do like a fusion of the two. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a, I think that's a, a, a good way of putting it. Some people do, you know, utilize insurance in some ways, break it out so that it can be billed. And some people put it as a whole global. And I think there's, there's certainly avenues and areas around that. There are some vision insurances, which uh, have a preclusion of not doing orthokeratology and make it so that it's not allowed as a vision benefit. I know some practices try to get around that by billing it as a gas permeable lens fit. Um, so I would, I would caution you because in an audit, you might get in, in trouble with that. So just make sure you're understanding your vision care benefits plans that, um, that make sure that they allow you to utilize uh, things like orthokeratology with your patients, obviously soft multifocals or soft multifocals. They usually don't have a preclusionary factor for myopia management. It just may mm-hmm. be a preclusionary uh, component for the type of lens that you're using, whether it's on an adult or on a child. So uh, I, yeah, I hope we get point. to see that changed with some of these vision insurance plans. Um, but uh, you just want to make sure that you have something in place for that. Ariel, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. I really appreciate you being part of the Myopia podcast. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yes. And thank you for joining us for this episode. Make sure to like and subscribe. Uh, we would love it if you'd leave us a five-star review. And uh, make sure to uh, tell all your friends about the Myopia podcast so they can stay up to date on the latest and greatest in myopia management. Take care. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.